Amy Helpman Laugh. And I'm John Moscow. Welcome to Ethical Schools. Our guests today are Michelle Vitale and Dr. Andrea Siegel of Hudson County Community College in Jersey City. Ms. Vitale is Director of Cultural Affairs for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Curator Benjamin J. Deneen III and Dennis C. Hull Gallery and the Art Concourse at North Hudson. Dr. Siegel is coordinator of the college's Foundation Art Collection. Welcome, Michelle and Andrea. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Andrea, would you start by telling us about Hudson County Community College? Um, Hudson County Community College is an inner city community college in Jersey City, New Jersey. We're coming up on our 50th anniversary next year. The college has about 20 thousand students, both for credit and non-credit per year, using our campuses, which are in Union City, we have two of them, and in Journal Square in Jersey City. Who are the students who tend to attend HCCC? What, um, what high schools do they attend, and what draws them to the college? Most of our students are Hispanic. We're an Hispanic-serving institution. Most of our Students come from the working class and they come from the local area and they are seeking that elusive thing, the American dream. They're looking to build upon the extraordinary efforts of their parents, many of whom are immigrants, to grow and change and make it such as it is in, in America. Michelle, what does your work at the college involve? What does it mean to be the Director of Cultural Affairs for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion? Um, it's an exciting role during this time in our history. I also run two galleries on campus. One is the Benjamin J. Deneen III and Dennis Seahill Gallery, and it's on the sixth floor of the Gabert Library. It's a 3,000 square foot facility, and it hosts exhibitions that usually include alumni, but then also expand to international artists and other organizations. And then at the North Hudson campus, I started most recently the art concourse at North Hudson, and it's a passerby area that connects the college to the local transportation. And we just wanted to honor the artists who live and work in that area and exposed all campuses to the arts. And so we're really excited about that too. And then we also do programming. We've had lectures. We recently had Nandaba Mandela, who's Nelson Mandela's grandson speak. And we hosted him in the gallery with like maybe 300 participants listening to him. I've also interviewed Tamika Palmer and the oldest Holocaust survivor in the United States. You work a lot with public schools. Could you talk about that? Sure, yes. We always love to partner with Jersey City Public Schools and, and beyond, and that's definitely part of our mission. Many times students start thinking about college as early as sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and so we're happy to be part of that conversation. Uh, we do tours. They come in and, and they speak to me. We just recently had a group of future leaders, which was a partnership with Mana Contemporary, and they spoke with Andrea, Lori Riccadonna, who runs the art program, and myself about, you know, just what roles they can they can fill as future art leaders. You're a former Jersey City public school teacher and an accomplished artist. How do these experiences inform your work with students? Well, <laughs> um, I always say that the kindergartners were my definitely my toughest audience, but I was lucky because they got my jokes. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I have I could be a comedian to kindergartners throughout the United States. I can really make them laugh, which is kind of sad on my part. But um, definitely being able to reach people. You know, Jersey City Public Schools is filled with a variety of ethnicities and languages, and it was great training to service our students here at the college. And I also think being an educator and being trained as an educator and, and really planning lessons that had objectives and had criteria, it definitely enhanced how I go about even teaching at the college. I'm an adjunct here and I teach a gallery management class. 
Andrea, what is the college's foundation art collection? The foundation art collection is over 1,200 pieces of works of art, largely donated, installed in nine or nine campus buildings and thematic groups. So we have a whole corridor of Japanese prints, a whole corridor of Filipino art, a whole corridor of art of the African diaspora, a whole corridor of Hispanic and Hispanic American art. We Outside the Writing Center, we have a whole corridor of art about writing, et cetera, et cetera, times nine buildings. The whole campus is an educational art museum so that every student goes through a fully curated gallery on the way to every class. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, As I understand it, you don't have a lot of resources to build your collection. So how do you do it? Yeah, we don't have a lot of resources. So what we have is an enormous number of civic minded art donors and a budget of about $45,000 a year to get everything framed, installed, and ready to roll. So we, we will put up several hundred works of art every year to grow the collection in its richness and its intensity. And correlation is not causation, but, and I wanna be very clear about this because the college has worked really hard to increase um, our number of graduates. But in my time here, the number of graduates has doubled. And I wanna say that this is not, the art collection is not causing this, but I don't think we're hurting the incredibly hard work that the college has done to retain students and help them toward a brighter future. It's, it's impressive and I'm proud of it. How do you find works that are relevant to students? What well, we started with Benjamin, Denise, and Dennis Hall. Michelle, do you want to talk about Ben and Den? You worked with De uh, Ben before you came here, didn't you? Yes. I just want to make sure I'm answering correctly. We're talking about their philanthropy. Is that what yeah, we're talking about? Yeah, and the about? quality yeah. of their collection. I mean, they just, yeah. our very first donors, uh, major donors, one was on the foundation board, Benjamin, Denise, and his partner, Dennis Hall, gave us over 300 works of art that were extraordinarily political and relevant to our community because they collected works of art by women and people of color. And so they started us on the best possible foot forward and we've done our best as donations are offered to us. And, and it, it's amazing as people hear about the project, they just want to give us more and more of their stuff. Uh, we just keep trying to grow it. So right now, the national average for museums in terms of works by women is about 13% of the collection is in on average in national museums is works by women in our collection. It's we're just about at half. We have works that where we don't know the names of the artists. And often when you don't know the names of the artists, it's usually by a woman. But yeah, we're about we're about 50% of our works are by women. We have substantial collections, over 100 by Asian American art artists from Vietnam, Vietnamese American, Korean American, Chinese American, Japanese American, and Indian American, as in not Native American, but India, India, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it just, it just, it grows just by word of mouth. You said that most students just walk by because the exhibits are, are in hallways, but when someone gets it, you've changed their life. Could you talk about one of those moments or a couple of those moments? My goal is like 3% attention. My feeling is if we have 20,000 students walking through here every year, if three out of 100 actually see what's on the walls, I feel like we have done a good piece of work. One student got so excited about what she saw on the walls, she came to my office and said, I am going to be your work study next year, which is if the work study, the federal work study program pays students a stipend to do work in the college that allows them to complete their degree. The money allows them to eat and function. So Mika Garcia comes by my office and says, I am your next work study. And she was, and she was one of the best work study students I've ever had. And after she graduated, she got a job at the Whitney Museum part-time. And from there, she went to the Museum of Mar Modern Art part-time. And then she went to be a full-time worker at Sotheby's Auction House. So when you see, our motto used to be start here, go anywhere. 
now I think it's it's different. It's changed, but she's one of those people who started here, caught fire, and is now you know a member of the art world. She is she is fully participating in at the highest levels of the New York City art world. So that's a story. Is that a good story? Is that kind of what you're thinking about? Yeah. Okay. Definitely, Michelle. Beyond Hudson County Community College. Tell us, what's the art scene like in Jersey City and in Hudson County more generally? And you can uh, interpret art scene in whatever way, you know. Yeah. You. Uh, so Jersey City and like the 1990s and early 2000s had a building called 111. And this was down in the waterfront, which was starting to, to really develop, but the artists were there well before that and that building housed so many artists and it qualified jersey city as having the largest studio arts tour in america and it's a it's a reason a lot of artists came here and not only visual artists but musicians we've had like a history of really established musicians living and working in jersey city as well and so through the years and all the changes and the redevelopment, I would say that artists now are not centered in downtown. You know, they're all over Jersey City in a lot of different neighborhoods, so much so that we have a program called the JC Art Crawl. And the Art Crawl basically asks neighborhood so art organizations and associations and artists to open their doors like on a Saturday. And that that kind of goes from place to place. We also have something called Art Fair 14C, which started in Jersey City, but has expanded itself nationally to visit other places. But that has allowed for something interesting to happen to the Jersey City and New Jersey art scene, which is people have started really collecting work in New Jersey. Before, it was really hard for an artist to live in New Jersey because you were competing against New York for collectors. But now, with the help of Art Fair 14C and a few other establishments like Mana Contemporary, people are really starting to look at New Jersey artists. Nork is also really developing. The museum has always had, I think it has the, the largest American painting collection in the United States. And it, Nork is in, a, in its own right is becoming also a real hot scene. So, you know, those are all great things for our students to be part of. Yeah, and, and the world also seems to be coming here. Michelle just recently coordinated this amazing evening called the Night of Ideas. The Musée Pompidou was behind the sort of curating or the idea behind this. Musée Pompidou is going to move into one of our old classroom buildings across the street from our library and have the first North American outlet for that Parisian museum in, I think, 2026 or so. So the world is coming to us as well. Yeah, if you want to hear more about the Night of Ideas, just quickly, it's a program that Villa Albertine actually leads, and they they pick a two-week time period globally to select sites. Um, and this year, they really wanted to focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Last year, they were at the Brooklyn Library, I believe, and this year, they just happened to pick Hudson County Community College, and I worked with them and the Center of Pompidou, and we had over 800 people attend that night. It was amazing. So for our listeners, who is Pompidou? The Center of Pompidou is based, its first museum was based in Paris. It's very contemporary and progressive museum that has a great, great collection, super diverse. And they have started having sites globally. And this is their site here in, in the New York area right next door to us. That's interesting. I hadn't realized that they had sites in the U.S. They don't. Um, this is the first one in North America. They've chosen Jersey City. But they have sites in other places. That's Yeah, they have in China. I think they have one in, 
maybe in Belgium, they have them, yeah, you know, maybe in, you know, all over. But for those of you who haven't been to see it, one of the wonderful things in Paris about this museum is the piping is all painted wonderfully bright colors and you can see it all. It's the skin of the building is clear. So you can see everything, all the ductwork and all that stuff that's going on in the museum. It's a very modern and strange and wonderful building. It was also designed to meet people at the street. So there's not this like very elaborate entrance to get in something like we would think of the Met. It's very public service oriented and community inspired. Nice. Yeah. I think you said that this is going to be right across the street from you. Right. We used to own a public service building and they, and it actually says public service outside, which they love. And now it's, it's going to be the new Papadou site for Jersey city. Aside from getting to, to know and understand art, is there, I, I would imagine that many of the students who experience these exhibits at the college have never had art classes in their, in their schools, because that's one of the programs that's been taken away from a lot of schools due to budget concerns. So I'm wondering if this encourages more students to to make art as well as to see art. Well, Jersey City Public Schools is pretty great at, it, at having the arts really cemented in their education. I was Jersey City Public School teacher for like eight years mm-hmm. and under the supervisor, Nancy Healy. And she Really, I mean, the students create path posters and then one is selected to be on the path train every year. And that still goes on even after she has long left her position. So I think that what may be new to the students is the the concept of, and, and it was new to me too. I mean, I had went in a, like one time, I think when I was a child, but you know, of what a gallery is and the difference between, you know, a commercial gallery and our gallery is that we welcome all to visit and there's a lot of educational material. So if it is your first time or a student's first time or a parent of a student's first time visiting the gallery, There's a plethora of information. Our docents are trained to be very welcoming. And so like some gallery etiquette, like don't touch the artwork. Um, We talk about that regularly and and how we can really greet the viewer with respect and not make anyone feel (laughs) as if they don't belong. Like I said, I, I typically have emerging artists. I just had an alumni in this past show with artists that have exhibited internationally and are at blue chip galleries. So we try and celebrate all people and make it really accessible to our students to dream and to hope that one day they'll be in the gallery too. And every semester we do a student show at when they graduate because we're a community college. So we have winter graduation and spring graduation and we highlight the students that are graduating And that's always a big competitive experience. The students are really excited to show in the gallery and it many times their first time showing in the gallery and it's wonderfully curated by the two coordinators of studio arts and and computer arts, Lori Riccadonna and Jeremiah Teipen. I'm sorry to interrupt, but Michelle, how many people do you see? You see a lot of people come through your gallery. How many people do you see come through every year? Typically, because we have programs We have an exhibition right now about voting rights and civil rights right in the main area as you enter the gallery. We also have installed a poem by Rashad Wright, who was Jersey City's first poet laureate. And we also, like I said, have exhibits in North Hudson. So a combined viewing at the college is about 7,000. And then when we do partnerships, like this year, we did an alumni group was hosted at Art Fair 14C. And Art Fair 14C had something like 7,000 people. And because we took over a booth, we can count those outside partnerships. So once again, I'm looking, last year we were over 14,000 and I think we're gonna be close to that if not over that this year. So it sounds as though both that the Jersey City schools uh, seem to be supportive of arts and also that there's a, a vibrant arts community. Do either of you 
have a sense of things that you'd like to see New Jersey City, Hudson County, the state of New Jersey um, do to support arts education and the arts more generally? Just if you just have, you know, wishes come true. Yeah, I mean, I, I could take that first. I noticed in other places, um, Newark actually is one of the first places that I saw it more locally. But, you know, there are things like teaching artists, mentorship programs that I think could be really wonderful for school districts to get students energized and excited about art and all the opportunities it could provide them as an adult. What would that um, look like? What is a teaching artist in that sense? A teaching artist is an artist who comes in usually for the year and they have a classroom and they're not so constricted to the curriculum of Jersey City, of the state of New Jersey. You know, they can do more expansive investigations in, in artwork and there's grading, but it's not as the same as, you know, an arts teacher. It would be, it would be like a compliment to an arts teacher. But I just think having that energy in the school, bigger projects, maybe some community projects could be really, really exciting. And it could bring um, students' work, I think, to the next level. One of the things, when you talk about dreams, one, one of the things I've seen very clearly here is we're at a curious moment in American history where we're witnessing the largest transfer of wealth in the history of mankind. And one thing I know as a person who's worked in the art world for many years is there's nothing a child of a collector hates more than their parents' art. So what happens is, as we have the shift to the generation, to the next generation, those folks want to find good homes for their parents' art. They don't want to throw it in a dumpster. And I think that community colleges and, and public schools are a great place for that to go. So what I've been doing, and I, I hope to make this bigger, is I've been mentoring other colleges in growing their own collections in Jersey and in other places in the United States. And we've got five colleges in New Jersey who sometimes a donor comes to me and says, I've got two works of art I'll give you, but I don't want to give you the whole thing. Tell me some other places I can donate. And my hope is to make this transfer of wealth, it's sort of a Robin Hood hope, make this transfer of wealth transfer to the people for whom it does the most good, to get it to the, the public schools, to get it to the community college, to get it to the public four-year colleges, so that folks can benefit from the enormous cultural capital that's been collected by the last generation. That's my hope. Okay. So Jersey City has... Uh, a lot of immigrant communities. When you have a first generation immigrant community, how do parents feel about a child saying, I want to be an artist? Well, it's funny that you asked that, Amy, because I actually am the first woman on my dad's side to go to college. My grandmother came here and she was a seamstress. She emigrated here and sewed American flags for a living. And then my dad's sisters didn't go to college, but, you know, uh, became secretaries and other things, executive administrative assistants. And when I said I wanted to be an art major, there was a lot of disappointment, you know, because I think, you know, it was, you know, maybe the goals were a little bigger. When I started out, they were like, what about being an accountant? And then when I said I wanted to be an artist, my dad was like, what about architecture? And really, it became glaringly obvious that I needed to be an artist, you know, and then that once I kind of proved that I I could advance and, and have a position at a college, I think they were really glad that I chose that path. But for a while, it was it was a little disappointing. Uh, my parents were really proud that I I graduated college and then I went on and I got my master's. Um, I also have a teaching certification. And with all those successes, they were really proud. But I think that you have to, if that's the route you take and there's expectations, you just have to, I think it, it really made me want to prove myself more, that this was something that was important and that I could be 
you know, providing for my family and I could have a nine to five job and all the things that your parents want for you when you when you say you go to college. Andrea, did you have a different experience, a similar experience? There are a lot of answers to that question, but I just need you to know that when I finished my I was the first woman in my family in my line to finish college. And when I told my mother what I was going to do, she sat Shiva. That's Jewish from when into mourning. Um, so it wasn't until much later. It was 1999. I finished college in 84. In 1999, uh, the New York Times did a profile on my work. And it wasn't until the New York Times actually put half a page with me in it that that my family actually understood what I was doing because what, if the Times explains it to you, it becomes real. So I, I forever I will be uh, grateful to Trish Hall who wrote that piece for explaining me to my family because that allowed me to re-enter the family. And my mother's response was to take the article which had my picture in it and make six placemats. They, they were clear coded. So I now have six placemats with my head in the middle celebrating the moment when I was reclaimed by my family. <laughs> I can okay. store, but I really think I should just keep my mouth shut. It just wouldn't be pretty. Is there anything else either one of you would like to add to the conversation? Um, let me think. You know, of course, more funding just in general for for artists, even emerging artists, because it's a lot of times many of our especially at the college level when we're, we're talking, I just did an artist talk last week and I had it with four artists and all of us spent a good 15 to 20 minutes trying to warn our students that when you leave the college, you know, still taking your artwork seriously is a lot on you, <laughs> you know, and you have to be your own champion and you have to, I remember as a younger artist in New Jersey, how hard it was to find a studio. I was painting my parents' basement. I would, I still can't afford a studio and I'm this age with a decent job. That public housing for artists, public housing for artist studios, especially emerging artists, then that way those dreams don't get deferred. We think about like, how hard it is now real estate wise to own something in the state of New Jersey. Think of that as a young artist, maybe even a young artist of an ethnically diverse group, you know, and how, how much harder that would be. And think about like all the Picassos we may be missing. So um, I think culturally it would be great if the state would take a second look at artist funding have categories of giving, you know, emerging artists, um, even high school artists helping with scholarships would be, you know, ideal just to make sure that our culture is preserved. I mean, our na national politics, our discussions need to shift toward some things we all agree on, which is we all agree that our children deserve a decent future. So we have a lot of work we have to do to make sure that happens. Basic things like making sure we have clean water and clean air. One of the problems with Jersey City is we have an enormous population of people who are who are working minimum wage jobs. And Jersey City is now the most single most expensive city to live in in the United States because of the incredibly rapid gentrification that's occurred here. So Michelle was talking earlier about 111 First Street and they, the artists came in and they do what artists do is they, they took an abandoned area and they made it attractive. And then what happens, this is the pattern, is the developers see that this is all possible and they make it, they move in and it becomes impossible then for artists to live there. So, I, you know, I think back to Johnson's Great America program and I think about all the affordable housing that was built in the United States that people are still enjoying the benefits of it. My goodness, it's time, right, for us to be putting some of our our tax dollars toward making the middle class a, a better place to be and make making that much more possible. You know, we've spent the last 40 years sending all our money to the 1%. So there's lots that has to happen so that our K-12 students can have the, the decent future that they deserve. 
Thank you, Andrea Siegel and Michelle Vitale of Hudson County Community College. And thank you, listeners. Check out our new video series, What Would You Do? A collaboration with Harvard Graduate School of Education and Ed Ethics. Go to our website, ethicalschools.org, and click video. The goal of this series is not to provide right answers, but to illustrate a variety of ethical viewpoints. If you found this podcast worthwhile, please share it with a friend or colleague. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and give us a rating or review. This helps others to find the show. Check out our website for more episodes and articles and to subscribe to our monthly emails. We post annotated transcripts of our interviews to make them easy to use in workshops or classes. Contact us at hosts at ethicalschools.org or on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and YouTube. Our editor and social media manager is Amanda Denchi. Until next week. Thank you.